Okay, so the first thing I've arranged this uh, presentation as if we were flying into Buenos Aires. Go. Sorry, it's going to be a little bit manual, but how's that? No, no problem. No problem. Um, go. Uh, one of the first things that I was struck by when I first started going to Argentina um, was um, I had no idea as a North American what to expect. And, you know, I, I South America, I expected, um, you know, uh, jungles and toucans and <laughs> iguanas and all that stuff. But um, Buenos Aires is... Um, is very European and, and is often called the, the Paris of South America. Um, it, is, it is a bit warm. It would be like flying into Miami um, from Europe. And then if you're gonna go fishing, flying out to Montana, go. I'm going to try and give you guys a little bit of a, the flavor of, of Buenos Aires in the, in the next few slides. Uh, go ahead. One of my favorite places to stay is the plaza. Um, it's, I think, 150 years old, and right now it's under its second or third year of renovation, so I'm not sure um, if it's going to be available soon, but if you're in Buenos Aires and the plaza is available, I highly recommend it. Go. Uh, you're all going to see a lot of food pictures in this presentation <laughs> because one of the great things about, um, about the experience is that it's, um, it's sort of all encompassing. It's a, a different cultural experience, um, different foods, different wines, um, different noises. Um, it's, it's really enchanting to me. Go. Uh, since the plaza has been closed for renovation, we've been staying at a different hotel and this is our breakfast, uh, breakfast facility. Uh, this wasn't breakfast, obviously. <laughs> Go. One of the things that we like to do with folks who haven't been before um, is to go to the cemetery at Recoleta, which is uh, an enormous uh, complex of tombs and mausoleums. If you were so inclined, you could probably spend several days uh, walking through the cemetery and um, exploring the different um, the different tombs and mausoleums. Some are, are are several up to seven stories deep, and families would bury their their loved ones uh, from the bottom up. and uh, And there are very a lot of very famous people who are buried here. Go. This is the chapel at the at the um, cemetery. Go. And a collection of um, close-ups of the tombs and the uh, the doorways. Ava Peron is buried in the cemetery, and and um, you can see by the um, how bright the bronze is that um, people come and 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 touch her her headstone uh, continuously. Go. And Avita is there as well, and you notice that her face has been. Um, cleaned by, by human touch as well. 
Go. One of my favorite um, things to do in Buenos Aires is to um, have a lunch at Las Nazarenas, which is my favorite restaurant in town. Um, it's been there, I don't know how long, but um, it's always been a constant pleasure for me to, to go in. And uh, oftentimes the, the waiters are the same people that have been waiting on me for 10 or 20 years. Um, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Go. <laughs> We're already telling stories. Go. I promised a lot of food shots. Oh, go ahead. Usually the, the, uh, we fly in in the morning and, um, because of the distance from the international airport to the national airport um, and the timing of the flights to San Martin or uh, Bariloche, we usually uh, arrive, uh, take a hotel room and take a little bit of a nap, do some touring and then have a, a group dinner. And this is, these are some scenes from that group dinner. Go ahead. go. As I said, um, Buenos Aires is very, very European in, um, in nature. And um, it's just a joy to walk around and look at the architecture and um, do some people watching. Go. Go. Uh, the hotels are fabulous, in my opinion. I mean, you can, you know, you always are going to get what you pay for. But um, if you're uh, interested in a in a exquisite experience, uh, there are a lot of wonderful hotels uh, in Buenos Aires. Go. And of course, there's there's the meat, <laughs> the beef. Um, uh, at one of the uh, restaurants we go to for our evening meal, our group meal, um, the uh, waiter comes out and demonstrates all the different cuts of beef and and describes where they're where they're cut from and how they might be prepared. Go. And then of course there's the uh, the asado, which is the the barbecue where the um, Cabrita and the and the lambs are cooked and and racks of ribs, go. Go. And go. The next step on the trip is a flight to San Martin at Chapelco. Um, which is a really beautiful airport. And it, it's interesting in that, in the sense that um, when I first arrived at Chapelco, it was about a 20 by 24 foot stone building with a fireplace and six tables. And uh, now it's evolved into, you know, kind of, well, actually an international airport, I believe you can fly there from Chile. Go. And Chapelco is just outside of San Martin de los Andes, uh, which if you are traveling um, to fish, might be worth taking a, a day or a half a day to visit because it's a lovely, lovely town. Probably maybe like Vale or Aspen was 50 years ago. Go. Go. And about a 45 or 50 minute drive is a Hosteria San Huberto, 
which is owned by the Olson family. Um, and their families actually settled this valley at the turn of the century. Um, there were two, two families, one took one half of the valley, the other, the other half. And um, I I've, I've just feel so privileged to, to call them friends and think of them as family. Go. After arriving, um, there'll be a, a, a brief lunch. It'll be a late afternoon lunch, um, probably inside after everybody's gotten to their rooms and, and unpacked a bit. Go. And two of my favorite, well, I have a lot of favorites in Argentina, but one is Milanesa, which we have here. Uh, breaded, breaded veal, and the other where the empanada is in the last, uh, the last image. Go. And then it's a drive up the valley towards the volca volcano Lanin um, and views of the river that we'll be fishing that, that afternoon and evening. Go. <laughs> <laughs> the guides are all wonderful. And I've known some of these guys for 30 years. Um, this is Gustavo. And um, if, if someone's willing to skate a mouse, he is all about tying it on. Go. So the river is, is um, I would say, you know, people ask me all the time, now that we have a fish in view, people ask me all the time, what's the, how would you compare fishing in Argentina and Alaska? And um, the response that I've come to is that fishing in Alaska is like being 12 years old and um, going to Disneyland. And fishing in Argentina is more of a cultural experience. Um, there's the, the people, the food, the language, the wine, and the fishing is great, but it's not no brainer fishing. It's, it's challenging. And, um, and I like that. Um, but there are good fish to be, be had, um, as you'll see in, in some of the, uh, the subsequent photos go. The water is interesting and it's challenging. And some of the, f my favorite water to fish in the world, um, there are, the Mageo is, if, if a, a pro golfer had been asked to design a golf course uh, like Arnold Palmer, um, he would design, you know, his favorite course. And fishing the Mageo, you almost get the idea that, you know, a, a fly fisherman, that God was a fly fisherman and, and he designed this river. It's like the perfect river. There are runs and riffles and pools and runs and riffles and pools. And it changes its character um, from, from this area, which is just below what we call the Henry's Fork. Um, there were no, no names to these pools and these areas of rivers when I got there. And I basically just, um, you know, this looks like the Henry's Fork. <laughs> this looks like this. Um, now we're in Wisconsin and willow shaded, you know, runs. And um, so I got to, I got to name these and some of those names still, still stand. Others have been changed, but um, the river is just incredibly interesting to fish. And uh, from, you know, channels and weed beds, you know, I could spend, I could spend an hour fishing what's in this slide. Um, to pocket water, to canyons with you know, tumultuous uh, currents and pools and um, pocket water, go. I could go on forever. Um, like I said, there are rainbow, brown and brook trout present in the river. Um, most of the fish that we catch are rainbows. And I think that's uh, a virtue of that we're fishing it 
in daylight and the browns are more nocturnal. Go. Something about the light down there that I just find fascinating and, and that's what I was trying to capture in this in this image. Go. Go. It's interesting over the over the years the it seems to me that the the fish have either become um, more wary of normal sized flies and less wary of very small or very large flies. And we fish a lot of attractors, which can be very exciting. Go. Go. One of my favorite time, well, oh, my favorite time of day, well, my two favorite times of day down there, early in the morning when um, the shadows are cool and you're looking into a dark space on the river, a dark run, and, you're, and your face is cool and you start to feel the, the sun warming your back. And my other favorite time of day is in the evening when those cool blue shadows start to creep down the mountain. We always try to time our trip to San Huberto so that it coincides with the rural, which is the, um, the provincial uh, agricultural fair. And you can imagine perhaps going back to Montana for a 1950s state fair or maybe mid forties. Um, there are no tilt whirls and, and uh, rides. It's all about uh, horsemanship and the, the gauchos showing off their, their tack and their abilities. Go. And there's also, um, it's also really interesting, all of the, the wares that are available um, from hand, handmade knives, hand forged knives to silver jewelry to uh, woven articles uh, to leather tack. Um, it's really, it's really kind of a wonderland. Go. And the competitions between the gauchos um, is super interesting to watch. Go. Go. Everyone that shows up is sort of dressed uh, to the nines. <laughs> you know, it's like the big social event of the year. So all the ranches, all the gauchos um, uh, show up with, you know, in their finest dress and their horses um, decked out to the nines. Go. And occasionally you find a youngster with a little bit of an attitude. Go. Go. This is a, a monumentous, um, monumental occurrence because the, the fellow on the right, Andino Grand, um, is the owner of the other half of the valley, the other half of the family. And I believe this is his grandson taking the award for, um, for a competition. Go. Besides the waiting on the Mageo, um, we oftentimes, if the conditions are right, will float uh, sections of the Illuminae River, uh, which are quite remote and um, and very, very beautiful. Go. This photo is by my, my good friend, Mike Dvorak, and uh, it's at the base of the Condor Cliff. 
And um, it is one of the most spectacular pieces of water I've ever fished. And it's not uncommon to have condors um, landing on the cliff above you, checking in on their, their brood, uh, worried that somehow you present a, a threat. Go. And the fishing's pretty good too. Go. On occasions where um, things work out just right, we're over to we're, we're able to do an overnight float and uh, do you know a day's fishing, pull up to the beach, and there are um, accommodations ready and dinner over the fire. Go. This is a South American kingfisher, which uh, is about two or three si times the size of our kingfisher. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful bird and it's not uncommon to see them. Go. At the time of year that we fish, um, it's often in the middle of the inchworm hatch and the willow trees along the river are covered with inchworms that drop into the river and the fish um, just go crazy for them. I don't, I'm not sure why they are so nuts for it, but maybe perhaps because of the, um, the sugar in the, in the willow leaves. Uh, I, I, I really don't know why, but it's like, it's like a drug for them. Go. 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 So in the Illuminae, again, we have browns and rainbows. Um, the brook trout are sort of um, relegated to the upper stretches of the watersheds near the lakes, which are often the sources of the watersheds. Go. go. One of the nice things about fishing at San Huberto is that it's, it's on a working ranch. Uh, the ranch's name is Tres Picos and um, it's about 40,000 hectares. And I don't know what that translates into acres, but um, imagine owning a ranch at, at you know, at the base of the Teton monuments. Um, that's a, about what this is like. But there, because it's a working ranch, there are, are lots of interesting things to do in addition to the fly fishing. Um, one is the opportunity to go for a horseback ride um, through the mountains. Go. Where there are um, caves with um, ancient um, I guess these would be pictographs uh, in them. Go. Uh, which my, my friend Mike Dvorak um, photoshopped <laughs> and put some ball caps on the figures and uh, some fish and flies. But trust me, no pictographs were harmed in the making of this image. Go. The other thing you might be um, privileged to see is, is a roundup and actually uh, watch the gauchos working uh, the herds to brand and inoculate. Go. It's quite a spectacle to see. Go. Go. I can't imagine how sore I'd be after doing this for a few hours. Go.
go. And these guys are doing this without gloves. I mean, I can't imagine. I don't want to split wood without a, a glove. <laughs> and these guys have these, you know, these leather ropes, woven ropes running through their, their hands. It's amazing. Go. But back, back to the river and back to fishing. Go. So the name of the game on the Mageo is sight fishing. Um, what we try to do is we try to put the fishermen into positions where they're actually fishing for sighted fish, either uh, rising to dry flies or sighted nymphing fish. Go. 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 People often ask me, you know, what are the hatches like? Are they similar to what we have here? And the answer is yes, um, exactly the same with some differences. Um, there are um, mayflies early, caddisflies, um, midges. Uh, the, the difference with the midges is that some of the midges are quite large like um, up to maybe perhaps even a, a 14 or a 12. Uh, there are stone flies, not as many stone flies as perhaps out west. Um, and terrestrials play a, a big part in the, uh, in the aquatic food or uh, the trout food. Go. Go. This is one of my favorite um, favorite stretches of the Mageo. It's it's called the Hayfield, and um, we used to fish it from the inside of the bend, um, and we still can. But the weed beds have sort of taken over, and it's it it's become a little more difficult. And it's a lot of fun for me to stand on the high bank and cast to the far weed beds, and then skate a a big attractor or a mouse across the run. Um, it's not, I, I, I normally don't have much success fishing from an elevated position, um, but oftentimes, you know, if, if you can get the fly in the right place and find the right fish, um, it's, it's a thrilling experience. Go. 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 So in the last couple of images, you've seen really wide open, rocky, um, free stone. And, and now this image um, down closer to the lodge looks as if it could be in Wisconsin or Minnesota. It's, it's a you know, a, a willow canopied stream. Um, and as I mentioned it, it the, the river is, it's almost as if God was a fisherman and he designed the river for us. Go. <coughs> Go. And everywhere you fish, it seems that Lenin is somehow in the in the background. It's it's hard to escape um, the volcano. Go. This particular fish was um, was it was a very interesting catch um, in that the 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 angler hooked about a ten inch rainbow uh, and he was playing it in to land it when this brown came out of a weed bed and just crushed the rainbow 
And um, usually that doesn't work out well. Um, I mean, it's exciting, but usually you don't land the bigger fish. But for some reason, the hook came out of the little rainbow and hooked the brown and uh, we were able to land this fish. And the other thing I'd point out here is that there's a, um, a mix of, of origin for the brown trout in Argentina. The, the German browns were imported in the early 20s and I believe the Scottish Loch Leven browns were imported slightly after that. But it's quite common to find um, fish that exhibit either one characteristic or the other. For example, this fish has a yellow, a yellow uh, belly and yellow body, um, which would be typical of German browns. And there are some little, you know, a few cherry spots, uh, but most of the spots are, are dark brown and are sort of leaden. And uh, that's more typical of the Loch Leven. Go. This is one of my favorite sections, um, which we call the canyon. It's about three miles long. And um, up until recently, there were no trails in or out of it. So you basically, you, you got in at the, at the top and you fished down and spent the whole day. And at the end of the year, end of your day, you'd, there'd be a pickup truck and a grove of trees with a cooler of beer in, on the front seat and some keys on the front tire. Um, and, and, it was, it was a magical place for me, but the fishing started to get a little, a little off. And, and one of my Argentine friends said, you know, you always fish it from the top to the bottom. So the fish are always used to seeing your flies at a certain time of day. Have you tried fishing it from the bottom up? And uh, it was great advice. And uh, I tried that and it was as if I was fishing a brand new river. And I'll never forget that. And I have to thank uh, Beto for, for that suggestion. Go. So back to the lodge in the evening, um, upstairs at the bar, uh, hors d'oeuvres are served. Go. While dinner's being cooked, <laughs> go. and later served, go. So the lodge uh, will take 12 fishermen per week, that's their limit. And there are 22 miles plus of water to fish within the confines of the ranch, um, just to give you a sample or a, an idea of, of, you know, of the availability of water. Go. Morning uh, out on the, gearing up in the morning is always a fun time. Go. Everybody's excited. Go. Go. We have a, a, a number of anglers from all over the world. Um, Nancy on the right is from New Zealand. She's fished her whole life in New Zealand. She grew up there. And, uh, and we had a, just a, a, she'd say a smashing time of it in Argentina. Um, my friend Jeff on the left um, was planning to go back next year and, and just recently passed away. And uh, we'll, we'll pour a sip out for him on our next trip. Go. I don't know how many times I've come over this hilltop, but I, I have to stop and take a picture. I, God knows how many images I have of this, <laughs> but I can't stop myself. Go. Go. It 
some mornings the 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 caddis flies are amazing and it's not necessarily the best i mean it's impressive to see but not necessarily the best time to fish um because the the flies are all mating up in uh, up in the willows and not on the water usually a little later in the day uh when the the flies land to lay their eggs is the best time to go. This is a perfect example of what I mentioned earlier. This is a Loch Levin brown, which has somehow retained its genetics um, and, you know, has that, that, that steel gray, gun gray um, color and, and chocolate brown spots. Go. Go. And one of the <laughs> one of my uh, biggest joys is um, the pleasure that uh, Lisa takes in catching small fish. It doesn't seem to matter to her if they're big or little. Um, it's it's always just magic. Go. I get the idea looking at this image that there's a fish uh, behind the guide and the angler that um, somehow has been missed. <laughs> Go. Go. One of the things Lisa and I love to do is to kind of, um, after everybody gets into fish and is um, is happy, we'll sneak off. And uh, this is a particular pool on the upper river um, where I had been trying to catch a fish, a certain fish for years. And of course, you know, that fish came and went and its prodigy took over, but it's it was a certain, holding area um, that this fish would always feed in and I could never quite figure out how to catch it. And Lisa and I would creep into the into the grass and and set up and watch this fish for you know half an hour, an hour, and it would feed from one station to the next. And um Lisa asked, you know, have you ever caught them? And I, and I remarked, no, it's, you know, it's impossible. There's no way to get a fly into that fish. And she said, well, you know, he, he makes this rotation. Um, maybe what you should do is you should just get all set up while he's away. And when he comes back, just dapple your fly on the, on the surface. And, and that's what I did. Um, go. And uh, he came back on his usual circuit and the fly was waiting for him, go. And uh, we landed him after all those years of, of me trying something else, I was, it was suggested I try something different, go. It's one of the uh, options fishing at the lodge is to take a shore lunch with you and um, a basket lunch and have lunch on the shoreline. Um, and the other is to come back to the lodge and uh, have lunch on the patio, which is, I think, um, I don't know, people have different ideas about it, but I like that option. Go. Go. And then after lunch, it's back to the river. Um, oftentimes people will take a little bit of a break. We usually have uh, lunch late, uh, about two. Um, and the fishing, the slowest part of the day is probably between 
two and four o'clock or five o'clock, uh, the hottest part of the day. Um, so a lot of people have lunch, take a little break, maybe take a nap and, um, and then hit the evening hatch. Go. Go. There's a lot of sunshine and there's also occasionally um, some storms that come through the valley and the valley, um, the Mejio River Valley is sort of a funnel from Chile, which can be very um, humid and wet uh, to the deserts to the east. So occasionally we have rain. Go. But it doesn't seem to put the fishing off. Um, this is a really interesting photograph in that um, I forget the, the rod maker, but, but the fellow who I was fishing with was a collector of these rods. And we determined that we were fishing a rod. His bamboo rod was older than our combined ages. Go. 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 The evening light um, is, is exquisite. And as a painter, um, I really appreciate, uh, I really appreciate the shadows and the, and the highlights. Go. And the smiles. Go. And of course the fish, go. This is one of my favorite backwater pools in the canyon. And we always seem to find a fish circling in that, in that back shadowed corner. One of the um, traditions at San Roberto is every Sunday night, we have an asado, um, which is a, a barbecue, basically. And um, it takes place a little later in the evening. And um, it's, it's a sight to see and an experience to behold. Go. 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 So everything is brought into uh, an outbuilding, which is called a quincho, which is, uh, you know, designed basically as a um, as a a dining room in a separate building from the lodge. Go. Beef is grilled, sausages are grilled, lambs and goats are grilled. Um, go. Go. And of course, um, the salad bar is, is beyond compare. And all of the um, vegetables are from the garden at the lodge. Go. Go. Uh, the talk of the day and the stories seems to, um, seems to um, 
quiet as uh, <laughs> as dinner is served. Go. 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 And then afterwards, the next day is just another another beginning. Go. This is my friend Nancy um, from New Zealand, and we spent a lovely week together. Um, she teaching me, and and uh, and hopefully me teaching her a bit. Go. It was really fun to watch her pick through and pick apart a piece of water, fishing it thoroughly. You know, um, leaving no stone unturned. And she's quite good. Go. Go. In fact, it was interesting. Um, we both enjoy uh, the fam familiarity that one um, grows into fishing a particular stretch of water repeatedly. It seems like you learn a little bit more about it each time you do it. And we fished the same bend in the river for four days straight. And it, I'd like, I, I, I can honestly say, I think we did better each day just because of, of you know, our familiarity with it. Go. 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 And it's time to eat again. <laughs> uh, one day during the week, we have a barbecue, an outdoor barbecue uh, next to the river. And this is from, from that day. Go. 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 It's uh, it's dangerous to get used to eating like this, because if you do, go. It often requires a after lunch nap. Go. But evening comes and. Uh, the hatches begin and we're back to the river. Go. 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 This lone little lollipop of a tree has been there since I've, well, it's been there long before I got there, but um, I remember it from 1985 and uh, it's just the perfect tree on a hillside all by itself. And it's, it's all, I always find it compelling, that the image compelling, go. It's dinner time again. <laughs> Go. 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 Followed by another beautiful morning. Go. 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 Lisa with one of her 
little beauties. Go. Go. One of my favorite pools to fish, particularly in the morning when the sun's high behind you. It's like an aquarium. Go. 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 And the week winds down one morning into evening after another. Go. And towards the end of the week, when the weather's right, we try to get up to the lake to fish um, Lago Troman, which is the source of the Mijeo. Go. Usually we will fish in the morning on the river and then drive up mid-morning and have lunch on the shore, shoreline, go. And then we'll fish the lake. But it's, it's not lake fishing as you might imagine lake fishing. It's, um, there, you certainly could throw a sink tip and a streamer and you could catch fish, but um, the game is to drift along the shoreline and um, fish terrestrials or dry flies under the South American beach uh, that overhang the, the, the lake uh, and the cruising fish that are looking for insects there. Go. Go. It's a beautiful, beautiful lake. Um, with lots of arms and, and uh, sheltered bays. Uh, it seems that no matter how, how hard the wind is blowing, we can always find some place to fish. And interestingly enough, it's, it's, it fishes best with a little bit of chop. Go. 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 I like to fish big um, attractor patterns, uh, Chernobyl ants and fat Alberts, and uh, seem to have good luck with that. Go. Go. It's really a magical place um, and a wonderful, uh, a wonderful place in the world to watch evening creep across the land. Go. Of all of the venues that we fish, uh, the lake is probably where we catch our biggest brook trout. They're present throughout the river, but, but we rarely catch them. I don't, inter I find it interesting that you know, brook trout are more prevalent in the lake <laughs> than in the brook. Go. Go. And these are, this is an interesting tree. This is an Awukaria tree. Um, or in England, where they've been, they were transplanted, they're called monkey puzzle. And they're, they're native in South America to an area about 80, 80 miles by 200 miles and, and nowhere else. They've been transplanted successfully, um, but this is their home range uh, around the Mijeo River. And oddly enough, the only relative tree in the world is in New Zealand and um, which sort of supports the whole continental drift theory. Go.
Go. Go. This is one of those photographs that you can never plan to take, but just happens. Go. Go. And go. So now we're moving on to a different venue. This is the Lamai, which has its source in Noawapi Lake, which is where Bariloche, San Carlos de Bariloche is. And there are several hydro dams on this river and the water between the dams um, is amazingly um, beautiful and, uh, and has amazing fishing. Most of it's done by drift boat. Go. Go. There's, there's streamer fishing if you want it, um, fishing riffles and runs with nymphs and indicators if you want it, and uh, fishing eddies and slicks with dry flies if you want it. Go. And the river is known um, particularly for um, big brown trout. And in the fall of the year, uh, when the browns are running uh, up to spawn, um, it can be uh, just a tremendous fishery. This is my friend Jorge Truco, who was the outfitter that sort of taught me the ropes when I, when I showed up there in 1985. Go. So a very different feel to the lodge and, and very nice. Go. And now we move on to Chile. Um, I love Chile. I love Argentina. Um, and I love Chile for different reasons. Um, Chile is you know, it's, it's a little harder to move around in because it's, it's so steep. The t topography um, is so steep into the Pacific and the road system isn't quite as um, expansive, but, um, but I just love Chile. This is Puerto Montt where you'd fly into if you're gonna fish the area in Chile where I've fished, uh, which is uh, south of Puerto Montt, um, Lago Yelcho, and the rivers in that area. Go. 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 <laughs> I had a great time with these guys. You, can you tell? <laughs> Uh, this is the lodge um, that we, one of the lodges we stayed at on um, the outflow of Yelcho, Lago Yelcho. Go. You can see why getting around in a country portrayed on the map in front of my friend Mark might be difficult, but worth it. So the water is very different. The, the, the landscape, the weather, the topography, the humidity is all very, very different. The water's generally much bigger. Um, you're, you're close to the, to the Pacific Ocean. So you've got, in some cases, tidal influence and big water. Go. And then once you get up into the, into the mountains, uh, big lakes with expansive uh, reed beds 
uh, where dragonflies and damselflies um, are the preferred trout food. Go. A friend of mine made me some poppers, um, and I, you know, I, I always like to do off the wall stuff, and uh, we we fished some poppers in these reed beds and and had a great time. Go. Uh, the young man on the right is uh, a fellow I guided with in Alaska, and uh, Mark on the left is a friend who I've traveled and fished with uh, for a long time. Go. So very, very different from Argentina. Uh, it's semi-arid. Uh, in Chile, there are hanging glaciers and, and uh, lots of weather and rain and big water and lush, lush forests go. 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 I'd forgotten how much I, I love chili I was putting this presentation together and, and commented to Lisa that, um, you know, I, I just, I'd forgotten how much I love it. It's just such a lovely place. Go. Go. And the flies are different. I, you know, I, uh, my first time to Chile, Gosh, I don't remember when. I, I, I can't put a, a, a year on it. But um, when I arrived, I was struck by the fact that I didn't have any flies big enough, <laughs> which, which, you know, I mean, after fishing in Argentina for decades, it was like, uh, you know, I, we'd fish little midge pupa and, and, you know, aphid patterns. And, and here I got to Chile and and I needed a three inch fly to imitate a dragonfly um, or a stonefly nymph. And uh, it's just, it's very interesting in how differently those fisheries are. Go. Go. So big water. Uh, which the guides, um, I think is harder to guide on because you've got to pick apart uh, big water in a different manner than, you know, walking up a stream. It's things are a little less obvious, maybe a little more hidden. Um, and the guides there really know their, know their stuff. Go. 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 And I think weather is, I think weather is more volatile on the Pacific side of the, of the Andes, much like um, our Pacific Northwest where Eastern Washington is a, a semi arid desert and, and the, the Pacific side of the divide is, you know, a, a temperate rainforest. It, it's very much the same in Chile. Go. Had to sneak one more, one more food dish in there. <laughs> Go. It's interesting in, in Argentina, um, Actually, I think Chile has a, a, an older history of guiding and fly fishing than Argentina does. Um, in Argentina, the, the guides are, are called guides. In Chile, the guides refer to themselves as boteros, uh, boatmen. And I think because most of the fishing is done on big water, 
um, from a boat. Go. Go. That's a fishing guide's hand. <laughs> you can tell by the calluses and the scars. Go. 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 Big water and lots of timber um, super interesting to fish. Uh, I, I think even more so than Argentina, I felt like, um, you know, on a float, like on this river, I was fishing 1% of the available holding spots. Um, you know, a guy could, our gal could walk up this stretch of river and, and spend an hour just picking the pockets between the logs and the, and the rocks and the, the runs and the seams. Go. One of the interesting things about the rainbows in Chile is because they come out of um, big glacial runoff water, they tend to have less markings and but sort of an inner glow. Go. Go. And I believe this is the end of our presentation. Thank you very much. You bet. I'm going to stop sharing now and turn it back over to you and Jeff. Thanks, Bob. That was uh, very great, informative. Um, just a few questions that we had in the chat. Sure. Um, we got about five minutes left. I'll just ask uh, what we got. If anyone has another question, feel free to put it in the chat right now. But um, first question was catch and release, or is it, uh, is the fishing catch and release or is, oh, yes, yes, of course it's, it's all catch and release. And much of that is by law. Um, all of the lodges that, um, that I've worked with, uh, that's their policy, but generally that's the law as well. All right. And then, uh, Next question, any issues with water and uh, food at all, I, I guess, as far as traveling? Oh, um, he, you know, uh, I would suggest in Buenos Aires to uh, use bottled water. Um, but once, once out in the country, um, you know, in, at the lodges, it's all well water. It's all, I've never had a problem with that. Um, you know, in the early days I did, I have some problems in Buenos Aires, um, but I think that um, my body has adjusted to all the different flora. <laughs> you travel enough, uh, your body gets used to it. But um, yeah, in Buenos Aires, I would suggest bottled water. And once you're out at the lodges, you're fine. Um, best time of the year to go. Hmm, boy, that's, that's uh, gosh. That's like asking what's your favorite river. It's like the one I'm fishing today. Um, I think like a lot of fisheries early season, um, the fish have been rested. Um, they're not maybe not as particular or picky, uh, but then, you know, you get into the fall and um, it's so beautiful and the browns start to become more aggressive because they're getting into their, their pre-spawning stuff. So. Um, I guess the thing to do would be to look at fishing out in Montana, for example, and think about what your favorite time of year to fish in Montana is, and then realize that the, the seasons are reversed and that, you know, um, if you show up in December, it's going to be spring and then on through the calendar to April, which would be fall. Um, and whatever season you like to fish out West, that would probably be the best time for you to fish in Argentina or Chile. 
Um, are you familiar with Estancia Teca Lodge? And if so, comfortable giving it a thumbs up? Um, I have fished the Teca um, out of uh, Esquel, south of Esquel. And um, I've never stayed at that particular lodge. I stayed at uh, Estancia La Leque. Um, but I have good friends who I trust who love Teca Lodge. And um, I haven't been able to talk them into fishing anywhere else. <laughs> so I think that's a good recommendation. Um, is there a snow melt runoff season similar to the Rockies? Um, that's a good question. Um, I've generally, I would always get down there around the first of the year. Um, the season starts November, mid November. I would suspect that there is, um, some runoff issues early in the season, like in our Rocky mountains. Um, but by the end of December, January, uh, things seem to be very stable. I haven't had any problem. And there's not a lot of rainfall that affects like Alaska, for example, where you can have a week of rain and the rivers come up two feet. That doesn't seem to happen in Argentina. Now, Chile might be different because of the gradient. All right, last question. Um, you had a few pictures of some pretty big streamers uh throughout the presentation is is that pretty common or can you talk about how you fish that uh that or that's really great uh question um so i i love to fish musky and a couple of years ago i went down there and i took nothing i took an eight and a ten weight in my musky flies and i uh committed myself to fishing six to twelve inch uh musky flies on these rivers for a week just to see what the hell would happen <laughs> and um, I caught one fish and it was a 19 inch rainbow. I threw a big musky fly out, it hit the water. And before I could strip it and get it uh, swimming, this rainbow came up and sipped it like, <laughs> like a mayfly. <laughs> and, I, and I hooked it and landed it. But I had a lot of fun. And, you know, it was just, I wanted so much to see if I could like pull some behemoth out of a deep pool with one of my musky flies. So um, I think that's the photo you're, that person's referring to. Yeah, it was. Um, all right, I lied. Last question for sure. Uh, can you suggest one or more Patagonia lodges that offer other activities in addition than fishing? Oh, you know, uh, I think all of the lodges down there are gonna be, um, as flexible as they can to make their customers happy. I don't have, I haven't had much experience in the last couple of decades with anybody but San Huberto. Um, but I, I, I think that would be a question that any, any potential fisherman or customer could ask the lodge uh, directly and, and get a more educated response to or answer to than I, that I can give. Great. Well, thank you very much for the presentation uh, tonight. Um, if anyone has any additional questions, um, you can always uh, email us info at uh, uh, Bob at bobwhitestudio.com. There and you I'm, go. I'm happy to, I'm more than happy to help in any way I can. And we have uh, a, a group that is leaving at the end of January. Uh, we'll fish from the 29th to the 5th of February, I believe. And we have spots available. And I'm told uh, by Lisa that um, airline tickets have come, actually come down. Uh, they're more affordable now than they were when we bought ours a couple of months ago. If you have any questions or you'd like to join us, just uh, give me a shout and I'll, I'll answer those questions. Great. And uh, just a reminder to everyone else, uh, again, January 25th is our annual meeting. Um, if everyone would show up again, that would be great. We just want to make sure we have enough people so we can elect the new uh, board. Um, and then uh, um, that's it. Uh, that, that meeting, just by the way, will be back 
um, at our normal location, it will not be, it will be both in person and online, but um, uh, those uh, details have been put in the newsletter. So um, thanks everyone and have a great night. Hey, thanks everyone. Really appreciate it. Nice job, Bob. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure, oh, Paul. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. Great job, Thank Bob. You. Great job. Uh, yeah, glad, you guys, glad you guys liked it. Thanks for tuning in. That must have been the in-person crowd. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you bet. All righty. Well, I'm going to sign off. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Yep.